يس دكتور علي جو هيد دكتور علي يو ار هلو 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 نايس تو سي يو ثانك يو بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أرحب فيكم في الجلسة الأولى لمؤتمر علم النفس الرياضي الواقع والتطبيق النسخة الثانية لهذا العام رعاية صاحب السمو المنطقة الشرقية واليوم طبعا تم الافتتاح صباحا واليوم طبعا حنستضيف في هذه الجلسه اربع متحدثين كرام من دول مختلفه نبدا طبعا ب متحدثنا الاول دكتور ستيوارت بيتاي اي هوب مستر دكتور ستيوارت ام نوت مس بروناونسينج يور نيم يس ذاتس ذاتس كلوز انوف Uh, well, you, you can please correct me if I uh, mispronounce it. <laughs> so why start? Do I start now? Sure, 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 Doctor. Okay, um, share screen. Mm. Uh, Doctor Stewart uh, Bitai uh, is a senior lecturer in sport exercise science uh, in uh, performance. Psychology, and currently he is the director of teaching and learning. He also uh, a researcher uh, in uh, mental toughness, resilience, and performance psychology in general. Uh, he also uh, worked as uh, wait, wait. a resilience project with wait. Uh, Can you Expedia expedition. Uh, also, the Youth Justice Service Resilience Project in the community with uh, Manchester, uh, uh, Manchester City uh, Mental Toughness Project with the England and Wales uh, Cricket Board and various lab-based study. Uh, Dr. Stewart, we welcome you here in Saudi Arabia and we will uh, we are uh, really happy to have you as the first speaker of this session. Uh, uh, I have a limitation in, in time that Dr. Ahmed uh, gave me and some instructions. So uh, you probably have 15 to 20 minutes if that uh, suits the presentation that you have. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I was in Saudi Arabia 14 months ago in Riyadh. Um, it was a fantastic experience and it's just a shame that um, I can't get back to do this live today. Um, okay, so I can share screen. Um, okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Okay. De definitely. Go ahead, please. Okay, good. Thank you. So um, today I'm, I'm going to present on some current thinking I have. So th this isn't a study that I've done yet. This is a study that I propose to do. And it's, it just came from some thinking over the past few weeks about some of the work that I've done in resilience, mental toughness, and, and some of work I've done in performance catastrophes in the past. And I'll, I'll explain what all of these are and how they tie together um, in, in this presentation. So if you're not sure where um, Bangor University is, then, then we are at this northwest corner of, of Wales, not far from Liverpool, not far from Manchester. Um, so performance catastrophes. So I'm going to give you an overview of what performance catastrophes are, why do they happen, what does resilience and mental toughness got to do with them? And, and again, this is my think, my current thinking um, on as a yet untested hypothesis. So I, I'd, I'd like to chase some research um, testing some of the questions that I have coming up. And so you might have all seen this Yerkes and Dodson inverted U hypothesis. 
and it, it hypothesizes that that you get this inverted U relationship between performance and arousal. So as general arousal increases, performance increases to an, an optimum point. Then if arousal keeps increasing, then performance gradually decreases um, at the same level as it increases. And this, this uh, inverted U hypothesis was, was used for a long, long time to explain behavior. But as, as human beings, then we don't generally follow a, a trajectory of a nice smooth relationship between variables that we have. Normally they're quite erratic. And, and you've probably all seen evidence for performance catastrophes in sport. So for example, in 2011, Rory McIlroy in, in the US Masters, he blew a final four shot lead going into the final round. He was four shots ahead of, of the opposition. However, he crumbled in the last four or five holes, I think, and he ended up with a score of eight over par and ended up blowing, blowing his chances of winning the Masters that year with quite a strong catastrophic performance in the final round of his golf. Recently this month, um, or just, just last month now, England cricket collapsed against India um, on a batting collapse and, and they were just 112 all out last month. And one of my favourite um, performance catastrophes came against um, England and Scotland in rugby um, a few years ago, where England at half time were 31 points to nil up for Scotland to come back um, and, and cause a 38 point draw at the end of the match. That's perhaps one of my favourite performance catastrophes. So how do exactly performance catastrophes come about? So this requires a mixture of ingredients. So one, you might have high levels of anxiety and continuing high levels of anxiety may, perform, may, may cause a performance catastrophe. High levels of physiological arousal. Yeah. So the more tighter you become and the more uptight physically you become, perhaps the worse your golfing performance will happen. Um, when the task becomes too difficult, you might disengage from the task and have a performance catastrophe. What you might see in some of your students is a high level of social anxiety and verbal presentation catastrophes. So when students present for the first time, perhaps sometimes you'll see a performance catastrophe happening then. Um, low levels of self-confidence and self-efficacy and perhaps loss of attention or control. But it's not just usually one variable in isolation that causes a performance catastrophe. Um, it's normally an interaction between two or more variables. So this is what a performance catastrophe would look like. Um, instead of the, the nice smooth inverted U relationship that I showed you previously, then in this case, um, in, in this particular performer, uh, performance will increase as physiological arousal increases to a point. And then there'll come a point where the performer just cannot perform under those conditions anymore. And they normally have quite a catastrophic effect on the performance. The performance will remain low performance will remain low as long as physiological arousal remains high. So th that would be uh, the two differences between um, what, what Yerkes and Dodson would call the inverted U relationship. And this one on the right hand side would be a performance catastrophe. And so it's quite, it's, you, you'll see quite lots of observations of that in fact, human behavior doesn't have this nice symmetrical relationship Rather, it might have this catastrophic drop in performance at some point. And normally, the, the inverted U relationship stands up quite well when anxiety is low. So when cognitive anxiety and concerns and worries are quite low, you, quite often you would see this relationship. But when cognitive anxiety levels are high, so you've got high levels of worry and anxiety, then that's when you're more likely to see a performance catastrophe occurring. And there's, there's different models that, that test different things. And so we know that performance catastrophes occur. So how can you best recover from a performance catastrophe? And so normally you would do what, what the opposite was that caused them. You would reduce anxiety, you would reduce physiological arousal, reduce levels of task difficulty, reduce levels of social anxiety, reduce increase levels of self-confidence and increase attention or control or a combination of the above. So from a, a performance psychology perspective, it's really important to understand what caused the performance catastrophe in the first place and how to reverse it as quickly as possible. 
And so again, on the left-hand side, we can see this um, inverted U relationship. And on the right-hand side, I've now added this red line. And this would be a recovery path. So under conditions of high anxiety, is, as physiological arousal increases, there'll come a point where you will have a performance catastrophe and a quite a sudden and dramatic drop in performance levels. One of the ways in this model is if you want someone to reinvest or, or someone to go back to a higher level of performance again, you'd need to significantly reduce physiological arousal before performance jumps back up again. And, and you could, you could, if you've got children and they listen to very noisy music, you could, you could imply this principle to that. And so here you might have that your children are playing music and the volume gets louder and louder and louder and louder. And at some point you shout at them to say, turn that music down. They'll turn the music down. Okay. Now they don't turn the music down just a little bit because from, for example, from here, they've got to turn the music down a lot before you're happy. With, with the situation. And so when, when they, they, they turn the music down, you get this gap between the, the noise of the music that you told them to stop playing at and the noise of the music that you are now happy to listen to. And, and we call this gap hysteresis. Okay, it's, it's a difference between what happens when performance drops into what happens when performance um, is regained. Again, I'll, I'll come back to that, this, this bit. And so the two graphs I've just shown you, these two, they make up the back face of this model, a nice inverted U relationship, and they make up the front face of this model. And you see the front face of the model is something increases to be a performance catastrophe, and it'll stay quite catastrophic unless you change something. And when something changes, at some point you'll be able to reinvest or restate a higher level of performance. And this happens under levels of high anxiety, but at the back face of the model when anxiety is low, you tend to get this inverted U relationship. There's other parts of the model that I could talk to you about, but I only want you to focus on the back face and more importantly, this front face of the model. So you get this recovery period from a catastrophe. So when um, something happens here and you have this sudden decrease in, in, in performance, then in order to get performance to jump back up again to a higher level of, of, of performance, something needs to change. Either you reduce anxiety, you increase confidence, you reduce physiological arousal, something has to change, okay? So we call this the recovery aspect after performance um, catastrophe. How could we get athletes to recover much quicker? Now, some athletes could recover very quickly. Nothing much has to change. Something just changes quite small and performance will, will regain to a higher level. But for some athletes, it takes much longer to recover from a performance catastrophe. So something has to change quite drastically. And so there is some evidence in, in the research about performance catastrophes. Um, but we've shown them in lab tasks, looking at basketball and bowling. This is Jurgen Klopp, the Liverpool manager at the moment, playing crown green balls. I found that on the internet. I had no idea he could play balls. And this was a study that I did in the lab in Bangor which was a rugby ball passing task. So rugby players had to pass the ball through these hoops um, and the task increased in difficulty. And at some point round about here, the participants disengaged because they couldn't do the task, but they re-engaged somewhere here when the task was much easier. So they didn't re-engage at the same level they disengaged at. And so when I'm looking at performance catastrophes and hysteresis or the recovery aspect, I've been thinking what might be able to help athletes? How, how could we prevent athletes from having a performance catastrophe in the first place? But when they do, how could we speed up the recovery after the performance catastrophe? And, and I've thought about two things that might do this. One is mental toughness and one is resilience. And so I normally ask people in the class because I'm, I'm short on time, I, I won't ask the room for the definitions on this. But in a classroom of students, I would ask them, can you define mental toughness? Write down what you think mental toughness is. And then I'll ask them, can you define resilience? Please write down your, your, your definition of what you think resilience is. And then I ask them on their thoughts on how do these two constructs differ? Now, normally I would do this in the class, but I, we're short on time today, so I won't do this. So instead, instead I'm going to tell you, tell you the answer. 
And so when we think about mental toughness, and I know that Dr. Turkey will, will go on to some of this later, then, then Daniel Gucciardi in 2017, he, he, he calls it a state-like psychological resource um, that helps you uh, maintain goal-directed pursuits. The definition that we came up with in 2014 was that mental toughness is an ability to achieve personal goals in the face of pressure from a wide range of different stressors. So in Daniel Gucciardi's explanation, there's nothing about stressors. In our definition, there is. So perhaps there's a good combination of, of a mental toughness definition that takes both of these definitions into consideration. So it might be now that mental toughness is a state-like and trait-like psychological resource that allows individuals to achieve personal goals in the face of pressure from a wide range of different stressors. So being able to achieve personal goals in the, place of, in the face of pressure might explain performance catastrophes. And so my thinking at the moment is that people with low levels of mental toughness, they might have a performance catastrophe quite early on, on whatever variable might be influencing performance. Whereas if you've got high levels of mental toughness, then you might be able to delay any level of performance catastrophes. You might be able to omit them completely, but you might certainly um, be able to um, postpone them. And so being really mentally tough and, and having a high level of psychological resources might be able to um, postpone or delay any performance catastrophes you have. Whereas having low levels of mental toughness, that might bring on an onset of a performance catastrophe quite early on. Okay. So that might be one way that we could explain or, or at least try to postpone a performance catastrophe by increasing levels of mental toughness. And then we go into about the resilience part of the module. And so when we define resilience, then the EPA Association describes it as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant sources of stress. And the Oxford Dictionary, perhaps but more important for the catastrophe model, is it's the ability of people or things to recover quickly after something unpleasant, okay? And the recover quickly bit is the bit that happens when you have a performance catastrophe. How could we best get athletes to recover quickly after a performance catastrophe? And it seems that resilience will play a strong part here. And so here's a picture I showed you before that this particular athlete's pathway performance trajectory will increase, increase, increase. At some point, they'll have a performance catastrophe. And if you want them to recover quickly, then it might be if they're low resilience, that recovery period takes a real long time. Okay, well, if they've got high levels of resilience, then that recovery period might occur quite quickly. And so with, with my current thinking and, and going out to try and test some subsequent hypotheses, then that's exactly what I'm going to try and look at. And so it leads me to some, some, some research questions in this area. Can mental toughness delay the onset of a performance catastrophe? Further, can resilience speed up the recovery from a performance catastrophe? The answer is, I don't know yet, um, but I am going to try and find out. Okay, thank you for that. And I, I'd, be happy to more, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Stewart. That's super in terms of time and also in terms of uh, uh, very high level of uh, uh, scientific information regarding performance catastrophes and arousal and anxiety you cover. I wish I can translate everything you said, but I couldn't because we are uh, really restricted in time. Also, you touched uh, mental toughness and you uh, did define it in a different ways in terms of performance and also uh, resilience. Uh, I can't uh, thank you enough, Dr. Seward, for your uh, uh, time and for your uh, uh, this uh, highly information. Uh, your uh, presentation is very informative. Uh, we will uh, just keep up or uh, 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 keep the, the question of your uh, uh, about your uh, presentation at the end after everyone is presenting in this session. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Uh,
Now uh, we would uh, uh, present uh, our second speaker in this session. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Andrew uh, Cook, and I am uh, also uh, I don't want to miss your uh, 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 pronounce your name, but uh, if I just make a mistake, just please uh, correct me. Uh, Dr. Andrew is a senior lecturer in uh, sport and exercise science. He is a lecturer conducting research in uh, psychophysiology, sports psychology, and skill acquisition, particularly interested in understanding the mechanisms that underpin human performance and psycho physiological intervention to enhance performance, such as train training. Uh, Dr. Andrew also worked with a number of high profile organizations in sport, business, and health. Uh, he is also a member of the Institute for the Psychology of Elite Performance, which is IPEP and lead the psychophysiology of the performance laboratory, which is POP lab. Uh, Dr. Uh, Andrew, we welcome you here in Saudi Arabia in this session of this international uh, conf conference. So uh, the floor is yours and you have uh, between uh, 15 to 20 minutes if that suits your presentation. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And thanks very much for that kind, uh, warm introduction. Let me just try and share my screen here. Okay, so hopefully everybody can now see my screen. Can you see and hear my screen okay? Yep. Yes, yes, yes definitely. Fantastic. So I'll make a start. So thank you again for that kind introduction. It's very nice to, to be here and have the opportunity to talk to you today. So my name is, is Dr. Andy Cook. Um, I'm a senior lecturer in psychophysiology. So I'm really excited today to give you my take on what I think is important in terms of how psychophysiology might have uh, an important impact for the, the future of the performance psychology field. So psychophysiology, what is it? Well, it's an interdisciplinary branch of human science that examines really how the mind and the body interact to determine behavior. So on the image on the slide here, you can see a participant in, in one of my experiments in the lab here in Bangor. And you can see that we have uh, various sensors on his scalp to measure his brain waves. We've got sensors around his eyes to measure eye gaze behavior various sensors on his arms and on his chest to measure his cardiovascular and neuromuscular activity, and also various sensors on the golf club itself to measure things like impact velocity and grip force. And by taking this comprehensive multi-measure approach, this is important because it can help us to address some really fascinating questions, I think, at the, at the heart of performance science. So for example, this approach can help us explore the mechanisms that actually underpin human movement. And it can also help us understand which mechanisms are most likely to fail under pressure. So Stuart briefly talked about catastrophes. We know under pressure, for instance, that it can have an impact on our cardiovascular activity. It might have an impact on our muscular tension. So by measuring these things, we can get a feel for actually mechanistically what is going wrong if performance changes in, in high stress scenarios. And then the thing that I'm most excited about, if we can answer these questions, we can then start to look at um, developing bespoke or tailored intervention programs to really help optimize athlete performance. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the second part of my presentation today. So this presentation is really in two parts. First of all, I'm going to just briefly touch upon some research I've been involved in using this psychophysiological approach to try and understand the mechanisms that underpin human performance. 
And then for the second half of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, brain training or something called neurofeedback, which is an intervention that I'm excited about to try and help athletes perform at their best when it matters most. So first of all, what, what determines optimal performance? Well, for the last 10 years or so, along with a number of colleagues, I've adopted this psychophysiological approach in, in, in lots of research studies. And typically what, what we've done is we've monitored uh, brain activity, eye gaze behavior, cardiovascular activity, and also muscular activity in both expert and novice performers and we've also compared patterns of, of psychophysiological activity between successful and unsuccessful performance outcomes. So in the case of the golfer on the screen, a successful outcome would be a whole golf putt and an unsuccessful outcome would be a miss. And the rationale is that if we can start to identify patterns of psychophysiological activity that consistently distinguish experts from novices, but also distinguish good from bad performance on a trial by trial basis, we can really start to generate this rich understanding of the mechanisms that actually underpin human behavior. Now I've conducted studies looking at eye gaze, cardiac activity, muscular activity. I'm not gonna talk about those today um, to, to keep it on time, but I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody's got questions about those things. Instead, I'm gonna focus on my studies that have involved brain activity. And in particular, the, the type of brain activity that I've used in my research is ele electroencephalography or EEG. And so for anybody who hasn't encountered this before, EEG involves using small sensors placed on the scalp. Um, we can measure electrical activity on the scalp. And from that, we can generate inferences about voltages generated by the brain. And the key advantage of this brain imaging method for sport and exercise psychologists is it's portable and it's possible to record during movement. So therefore it's more advantageous than perhaps an fMRI scanner, for instance, in, in our discipline. Um, by recording EEG, we can look at different brain waves. And in particular, without going into too much detail, researchers have been most interested in what's known as the alpha brain waves, because the presence of alpha waves indicate an active inhibition of certain brain areas. So by measuring the amount of alpha waves that sensors over different parts of the cortex, we can start to build an understanding of which parts of the brain are activated and which part of the brain is inhibited at, at certain points of, of motor performance. And so one of the first studies that I conducted using this approach was in 2014. Um, we compared the patterns of brain activity using EEG between expert and novice golfers and also between hold and miss puts. Now these colored pictures here are something called time frequency plots and you don't need to be an expert in, in understanding these plots to see that clearly there's a difference between the expert and the novices. And the key thing to focus on is these colder blue colors here. And on the graph, they manifest as a reduction in the presence of alpha waves in the final moments preceding movement. Now we're recording here at a site called FZ, which roughly overlies the motor cortex. So this can be interpreted as an increase of excitability over the motor cortex in experts compared to novices. But the thing that was most exciting was when we compared puts that went in the hole versus puts that missed, we also saw a difference to the extent that we were actually able to predict based on brain waves about a second and a half before the initiation of movement, whether or not a ball was gonna go in the hole or whether it was gonna miss based on, based on brain waves. And, and certainly um, there was more activation on the successful performances. And so this was really exciting because we revealed a brainwave that we think is, is conducive to optimal motor performance in, in, in the sport of golf. So that brings me on to the second part of the talk now. How can we actually use this information to help athletes perform better? And one approach that I've been researching for the last five years or so now is something called neurofeedback, actually training athletes to control their brainwaves to ensure that they're actually producing these patterns that we think are conducive to optimal performance before they actually execute their technique. So how would we do that? You might be thinking that sounds a little bit abstract. So the way I often explain how this neurofeedback training works is with the example of a heart rate monitor. 
I'm sure many of you will have worn heart rate monitors as wristwatches at certain points. And if you've done that, you'll learn pretty quickly that if you look at your heart rate, you can just by changing what you're thinking about, you can make your heart rate increase by a couple of beats per minute, or you can perhaps make it decrease a little bit. So the idea is when you see that physiological signal on your wrist, you can start to learn how to control that signal to a certain extent with your mind. Now with neurofeedback training, we adopt the exact same principle. So by applying sensors to an athlete's scalp and then displaying their brain waves back to them in real time via graphs on a computer screen or perhaps via an audit auditory tone, participants can actually learn quite quickly how to increase or decrease their activation at certain areas of the scalp. Now, if that's still sounding a little bit, a little bit strange to you, I'm gonna show you a brief video now that I hope can really illustrate that. So this is two participants in our laboratory here in Bangor, they're croquet players. And you will see this participant's brainwaves on the screen behind him, but you'll also hear an auditory tone. And that tone reflects his activation over the frontal central areas of his brain. And the tone is programmed to silence when he increases activation and thereby produces the brainwave that we think will help him to perform as best. And so his goal is to silence the tone and then execute his shot when the tone is silenced. So you can see the brain waves on the screen behind and hopefully you can start to hear the tone. And when the tone silences, he actually hits his shot. So again, you see the brain waves on the screen here. He's working to learn how to control his brain waves to silence the tone. And when he does that, he's in the zone, he can hit his shot. So that was a video of, of two participants that was just running a training session in our laboratory here. But actually I used that exact technique five years ago in a study of neurofeedback training with golfers. And um, this was one of the first uh, controlled neurofeedback studies in, in the sport literature. And it was based on our earlier finding that um, a reduction in frontal central alpha power was associated with optimal performance. So in this study, we actually trained 12 golfers to reduce frontal central alpha power before hitting their putts. And we compared them with a control group who didn't receive brain training. Participants received three hours of brain training using exactly the technique you just saw, where they heard an auditory tone and they had to silence the tone before hitting their putts. And we compared their brain activity and also their performance from pre-test, i.e. before the training, to post-test, i.e. after the training, to quantify any effects. And again, you don't need to be experts to, in understanding these plots to see that there was clearly a difference from pre-test to post-test among members of the neurofeedback group where you've got these cold colors here that emerge in the post-test. And this shows us that members of the neurofeedback group in just three hours of training had really learned how to control their brain waves and how to increase activation before hitting their puts. So this was really exciting for us. Members of the control group who didn't receive the brain training, their brain activity remains pretty stable as one might expect. And importantly, when we look at performance, there was also an improvement in performance from pre-test to post-test, an 8% increase in the number of puts hold and a 20% reduction in radial error. So after this intervention, people tended to perform a little bit better. So we were really excited by this finding. And since then, uh, a few other uh, laboratories in various parts of the world have replicated this finding. There's an increasing body of evidence that's making a case for how neurofeedback might be beneficial for sport performance. And to really illustrate that in the real world, a number of uh, leading professional golfers have now started using neurofeedback training and have gone on record as, as um, explaining how they feel that is helpful to their game. So for instance, the Australian Jason Day was one of the early advocates of neurofeedback training. Britain's Olympic gold medalist, Justin Rose, has been documented 
uh, talking about neurofeedback training for his short game. And perhaps most recently, the American uh, Bryson DeChambeau has talked about how he's used neurofeedback training and, and how that might have contributed to his dramatic rise in the world golf rankings over the last 12 to 18 months. And actually, the technology has now been commercialized as such that golfers can actually get this feedback when they're out on the course. So this picture shows somebody wearing a headband to record their brainwaves. But actually, the most recent development I've seen is involve sensors actually embedded in golfers headwear so they can actually get real-time feedback on the course so this is something that's uh, really exciting okay so moving on from golf i'm just going to talk for a couple of minutes at the end about a new uh, area of neurofeedback research that i've been involved in where i've been looking at the effects of neurofeedback on endurance cycling now, we're not blessed with previous research identifying a candidate pattern of brainwave that we think would be conducive for endurance cycling. However, we can consult the neuroscience literature to make some hypotheses. And specifically, we know from the neuroscience literature that when people have a relative increase in left frontal cortical activation, this is often associated with positive feelings and approach motivation. In contrast, when participants have relative increase in right frontal activation, this is associated with more negative feelings and withdrawal motivation. So if we apply this to endurance exercise, we know that as people push themselves to their physiological limits, it starts to become a little bit painful. And one of the primary reasons that endurance exercise terminates is because participants have an increasing urge to withdraw as pain increases. So we hypothesize that if we train people to increase relative left frontal activity, this might delay this urge to withdraw and thereby, thereby benefit endurance performance. So to test this hypothesis, we conducted an experiment. This was with a PhD student, Francesca Matola, and two of my colleagues here at Bangor University, Anthony Blanchfield and James Hardy. And we recruited some cyclists and we randomly assigned them to a group that received either left frontal cortical activity training, increased right frontal cortical activity training, or a control group. And they received uh, 12 minutes of neurofeedback, and then they went straight on a bike and performed a time to exhaustion test, an exercise test. And we were quite blown away by the findings. We actually found that members of the increased left frontal activation neurofeedback group were able to cycle for about 30% longer compared to their counterparts in the control and the right frontal neurofeedback group. In fact, we were so excited by these findings that we thought we should replicate this study before actually um, publicizing these findings just to double check. And so we ran a second study, and this time we adopted a within subject design where participants um, came to the lab on two separate occasions. And on one visit, they were trained to increase left frontal activation. And on the other visit, they trained to increase right frontal activation. And we replicated the finding whereby performance was significantly better on the visit where they were trained to improve or increase rather left frontal activation. So we're excited about these findings and I'm excited to share them today because these findings are currently under review. They're not yet published, but I'm optimistic that, that hopefully these will be published in due course. And I think that they could potentially um, make quite an exciting impact on the cycling community. So for any endurance uh, athletes out there, uh, brain interventions potentially could have great potential for, um, for endurance exercise. So to finish then, I hope from this talk that you've got some appreciation of what psychophysiology is now and how psychophysiological monitoring might be a valuable tool to help us understand some of the mechanisms that underpin human performance. And I hope in the latter part of the talk, I've given you a flavor for how psychophysiological interventions such as neurofeedback training might be used to help enhance human performance. And I'm really excited by this because I think the brain is one of the few relatively untapped resources where there is considerable potential for competitive advantage for the first uh, organizations, athletes to get on board with these sorts of interventions. So I think there's a bright future for, for psychophysiology in the sport and exercise psychology field. 
So before finishing, I'd just like to acknowledge the, the students and staff collaborators who have worked with me on the projects that I've presented in this talk. So their names are all on the slide there. And um, finally, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for, for listening to me. And if anybody's got any questions later on, I'd be very happy to, to answer them. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Andrew. And uh, uh, thank you for the informative uh, uh, presentation. And uh, thank you for uh, keeping up with, uh, with time. And that's very important to me and to everyone here. Uh, you touched uh, psychophysiology and you try to answer what determined the optimal performance. You also touched and explained the neuro uh, feedback in golf, and also the experiment you did in the endurance cycling. Uh, appreciate uh, the, the highly information that you present us today, and we wish you uh, the most success in your uh, uh, engaging the neuro uh, uh, physiology and also the uh, the technology that you are trying to bring to the uh, experiment that you are doing, which is uh, now we are facing in, in the sport industry, we are facing uh, a big di dilemma that uh, uh, are we gonna uh, move from human to uh, machines uh, because of the uh, artificial intelligence is going too fast uh, to, to our field. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, we'll keep the question at the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, third speaker today in this session is one of my, uh, uh, I don't want to say that uh, Dr. Turkey, you are my, one of my students, but uh, uh, I, I will say it uh, because I'm proud of you. Uh, Dr. Turkey is a, uh, a sports psychology lecturer at Taif University. He is currently the director of research at the sports science department at Taif University. His research interests include mental toughness, resilience, and performance psychology. Uh, Dr. Turkey, if you are with us, so we, uh, the, the floor is, uh, all yours, if you keep up with time, you have 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, I really appreciate uh, I'm proud uh, too. Uh, you are uh, one of my uh, uh, lectures and you, you are, uh, we uh, uh, learn a lot of things from you and from all my uh, teachers uh, everywhere. So uh, thank you for inviting me for this conference. I'm so happy to be with you. And uh, thank you for uh, Saudi government uh, for uh, support and care about uh, this uh, important event. Uh, thank you for all these people work uh, in this conference behind this screen. I really appreciate. And uh, now we will start uh, our presentation. Uh, it's clear now. No. Can you see my my screen, guys? My my PowerPoint. Yes. No, it didn't. Yes, it didn't come out. Okay. So today we will talk about uh, mental toughness in sport. Uh, mental toughness in sport, uh, like uh, receive a lot of attention uh, last uh, 20 years ago. So uh, in this presentation, I will take uh, an overview about what uh, a researcher find out about this uh, subject. So uh, in this uh, presentation, we will talk about what, what is mental toughness? what are the tributes of uh, mental toughness, 
uh, how do researchers measure it, uh, why do researchers measure it, and what is the aim of our research we have done, uh, what happened with my screen. Sorry. So how, how do we do this research and what the future direction? So at the start, I will talk about what is mental toughness. Uh, mental toughness has been commonly used in sport, but it is poorly understood. There are different conceptualization about mental toughness construct. The majority of previous research has failed to provide clear definition about mental toughness construct. Most of existing definition describe what mental toughness does rather than what mental toughness is. For example, Jones 2002, he described mental toughness as coping better than your opponent. And uh, uh, Clough 2002, he described mental toughness, uh, he described mentally tough individuals. They are more uh, sociable and they are uh, outgoing and describe some att attributes uh, which uh, describe what is mental toughness. So uh, these uh, the definitions and description have produced list of attributes about mental toughness. For example, uh, keep going, ability to have uh, self-confidence, uh, with the standard felicity, uh, and being uh, more confidence, more control, self uh, commitment challenge, uh, self-efficacy. So uh, Daniel in his book, uh, 2011, uh, about mental toughness in sport. He summarized uh, over uh, more than 100 uh, attributes about mental toughness uh, construct. So these uh, uh, attributes were found by using two different kinds of approach, uh, qualitative study and quantitative study. Qualitative study, which rely on, uh, uh, on interviews and observing people and rate from others. Uh, quantitative study which rely on uh, self-report and uh, uh, questionnaires. Both of these uh, approaches uh, have received uh, criticism, for example, qualitative study criticized by uh, overuse and produce list uh, uh, attributes. However, uh, uh, quantitative study uh, have, uh, uh, has uh, received uh, criticism by uh, for uh, poor reliability, poor uh, validity, and being specific, uh, specific uh, for uh, athletes or uh, specific sports. So uh, uh, mental toughness could be uh, taught uh, from uh, positive teaching, could be uh, caught uh, from uh, positive experience, could be genetic, uh, could be uh, 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 something uh, people could learn from uh, uh, fails or failure. So, uh, also uh, different authors believe mental toughness differently. Some authors believe mental toughness as one construct. For example, uh, the Daniel Gucci Rai, 2015, he believed mental toughness as one construct. Uh, others uh, believe mental toughness has uh, different uh, component. Um, uh, for example, Clough 2002, he believed mental toughness has different components, for example, control, commitment, challenge, and uh, self-confidence and commitment. So uh, these uh, conflicting findings from different researchers and authors uh, bring questions uh, for us uh, why uh, there, are the, there are a lot of conflicting findings and this is the reason we uh, uh, do this research to find out and uh, uh, be more uh, uh, confident about our uh, findings. So uh, mental toughness could be a state uh, or could be trait, as we said before. Uh, the previous research uh, have uh, suggested that uh, it will improve our understanding to use uh, uh, a theoretical approach to examine mental toughness. So uh, previous research, uh, collecting data uh, from uh, uh, a 
athletes' uh, opinion or perspective and coaches' perspective and uh, uh, rate from others. Uh, so uh, uh, Milton and uh, Cross 2007, he suggests that it will improve our understanding if we uh, measure uh, mental toughness from uh, athletic model. And uh, this, uh, uh, what uh, happened with uh, uh, Dr. Hardy and Stuart Bitty and uh, uh, his colleague, they have uh, used an uh, athletic approach uh, to collect in, uh, to examine mental toughness. They have used uh, reinforcement sensitivity theory as a theoretical approach to examine mental toughness. Uh, to uh, avoid all these uh, uh, limitations, uh, what I have talked about it. So uh, also they have uh, defined mental toughness uh, as Dr. Stewart uh, talked about it. And uh, they have used uh, uh, this theoretical, uh, they have uh, designed eight items which, which uh, uh, examine and uh, collecting data uh, about uh, Cricket, uh, cricket players, where uh, coaches uh, rate uh, their players. So uh, this uh, uh, theory, uh, it's comprised uh, uh, of uh, three components, behavior activation system, behavior adaptation system, and flight, flight, uh, flight, flight, decreasing system. Behavior activation system where uh, 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 individuals approach to get some reward or win something. Uh, fight, flight, uh, prison system when uh, individuals avoid threaten uh, and uh, behavior inhibition systems, uh, it's uh, resolve this uh, goal of conflicting, goals conflicting between approaches and uh, avoid. So, they have used uh, this uh, theoretical approach and they have uh, uh, suggested that a uh, high mental toughness will uh, associate it with uh, uh, high reward and uh, low mental toughness will associate it with uh, punishment. However, when they uh, examine the mental toughness, they have found that high mental toughness uh, associated uh, with, uh, with uh, high punishment and uh, low mental toughness uh, 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 was uh, associated with uh, uh, low, uh, with high uh, reward. So high punish, high mental toughness was associated with punishment uh, when people uh, uh, punished. Uh, high, low uh, mental toughness uh, associated with uh, reward. Uh, based on previous research, uh, why uh, Dr. Hardy and his colleague suggest that? Because uh, previous research, uh, uh, Prinkis uh, 2007 and 11, they have found that uh, high performance associated with high reward and low performance associated with uh, uh, high uh, punishment. So uh, after that, they have uh, uh, done uh, interaction between uh, punishment and reward and uh, mental toughness and they have found that when reward when reward is Гандон, нюхни газку с моей жопы. Uh, I think uh, I have to continue. So, sorry about this uh, mistake. Uh, I think someone uh, opened uh, their mics and uh, I don't know how can I mute it. So uh, uh, they have done uh, interaction between uh, uh, punishment and reward and uh, mental toughness, they have found that where reward sensitivity was low as punishment increase, mental toughness increase here. And uh, they have uh, find uh, similar findings uh, 
and and uh, and two studies. Uh, also, they have find similar uh, findings in uh, uh, swimming uh, competition. Uh, they have found when uh, reward system was low, as uh, uh, punishment increase, uh, mental toughness increase, and when reward uh, sensitivity was low, as punishment increase, race time for swimmer as um, uh, increase. So uh, uh, we uh, 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 they have suggested that uh, after uh, they have done this research. Uh, those uh, mentally tough individuals who... Our last speaker, but not least, uh, Dr. Uh, Anna Carolina uh, Palodo. Am I pronouncing your, your name correctly? Yes, correctly. Okay. Uh, Dr. Anna Carolina is a lecturer at Unicentro University in uh, Parana, Brazil. Uh, she has a PhD from University of Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo, and she is right now, she is working in uh, the School of Physical Education and Sport. Uh, Dr. Anna, the floor is yours uh, within uh, 20 minutes, please. Huh? Okay, can you see my presentation? Perfect, yes. So let me introduce when, where I live. I um, come from Brazil. I'm from Brazil here in South America and more specifically in Brazil. I'm living here in this green is the Paraná state in Guarapuava. And so just for you to see how far we are, but thank you for the internet. We can stay connected. So today, I will talk about the relationship about hormones and behavior and how this relationship can affect performance. Dr. Andy and Dr. Stewart talking about the Dr. Stewart talking about the, uh, the catastrophe theory and Dr. Andy uh, bring us physiological response. And now I think that I can continue this physiological response and the relationship with athletes' performance. So everybody that involved in sporting settings, they're looking for a reach, a higher place, a golden medal. So for achieve this, uh, this purpose, uh, uh, they need to train, to build a good training program to improve the athlete's performance. This Training involves physical and technical exercise, but also physiological capacity. And this, and this topic is, is about sport physiology, the topic of uh, this conference today. So between, yeah, amongst the sport uh, psychology, I will talk about a little part about how hormones and behavior, they relate and how they, they can maximize athletes' performance. So the hormones were re released by a neuroendocrine system, and they can be released by exercise, generating energy and restore the muscle damage in order to improve performance, but also the hormones can be released through some behaviors and emotions. As I said, behaviors and emotion can trigger the release of some hormones that can impact the athlete's sport performance. And the, this impact can be positive, uh, increase the performance, but also can be negative, decreasing the performance. Uh, I will talk today about some behaviors and feelings uh, like anger, fear, and anxiety. How these feelings can trigger the release of some hormone and impact the sports performance, but also how can some hormones concentration can trigger some hormone behaviors in athletes. 
So let's start talking about testosterone. Testosterone is released by the eggs, HPG. And testosterone is released during the training session uh, in order to help to grow muscle, to strength, to bone density, and specifically in sports, in athletes, to help they increase the physical performance. But also the testosterone can be released uh, for in some behaviors like aggressiveness, dominance, sexual function, anger, and others. Some behaviors that increase the testosterone concentration have a positive relationship with improve the athlete's performance. So one example is the, the behavior of te territoriality and dominance that occur in home advantage. advantage sorry. In this way, uh, when players play at home, they seem to, uh, to improve their dominance behavior, the territoriality, to, they want to protect the territory from enemies. Uh, in, this, in this case, in this study, they show that when players are play at home, they present more testosterone concentration. And this can be uh, related with, uh, with an advantage. So this we call home advantage because they play home, they protect their territory and they increase the testosterone concentration. Also, some motivational interventions uh, can improve the testosterone concentration in players. This, uh, this, this research, they showed some motivational interventions to improve the player's uh, testosterone before and game. In this case, they, they put athletes watching some videos and listen, some, listen to some music. And they found that when players watch some videos, they increase their testosterone and, cons and consequent they also increase their performance during, the play, during a game. In the same way, the same authors, they, they put uh, uh, short videos before an exercise, video with contents like erotical, humor, and aggressiveness, and training, uh, and training content. And they found that uh, after watching this video, the players present an increase in testosterone. But as specifically, when, we, when he, they watch aggressive and training videos, they present a higher training load during a squash, uh, squash exercise. So therefore, motivational interventions can increase the testosterone concentration and consequently improve the performance. However, some conditions can attenuate the concentration, the, the testosterone release. In this case, I helped in a project with mental fatigue, and we found that when the athlete, athletes are mental fatigued, the testosterone release are impaired, and consequently, the performance is also impaired. So uh, when in, in condition of mentally fatigued uh, situations, the testosterone release can be impaired. Other hormone that is related directly in behavior is estradiol. Uh, estradiol is one of hormonal, uh, horm ovarian hormone, hormone present, in the, uh, present with variation in the menstrual cycle. So women present a variation in ovarian, ovarian hormones during their menstrual cycle phase. And this variation can impact on mood and motivation. This study show us that when women present higher levels of stradiol 
estradiol or ovarian hormones, these, these hormones can modulate the brain activity. So in phase that women present higher level of estradiol, they also um, uh, respond the mood uh, in decreasing on the other hand, uh, on the other word, higher estradiol, they protect women for a bad mood. So this is, uh, this is important because they protect to a bad mood, but also increase the women motivation and how this can impact in our athletes. It studies having shown that when, uh, when athletes, the women athletes are in the phase with increase of ovarian concentration, they also present more testosterone in their body. And this testosterone can help to improve the performance. And also in the phase with increase of ovarian concentration, the athletes show more desire to compete and more motivation to training. In the same way, uh, the same authors, they report that in the uh, in the phase, the menstrual, uh, the menstrual cycle phase that women present a higher increase of ovarian concentration, they, they, they demonstrate more motivation to train. And this happened with both elite and non-elite athletes. So uh, in this case, the hormones concentration modulate the behavior, the bad, uh, attenuate the bad mood, and increase the motivation to compete. And finally, other hormone important and extremely related to behavior is the cortisol. Cortisol is a hormone uh, released by the X, HPA, hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal gland, and the cortisol is releasing during the training or during the exercise in order to generate more energy. But also the cortisol is released in a stressful situation like um, when anxiety and fear and this, uh, this situation that can generate this, this feeling. But when cortisol is released for a stress situation, they can be danger for our, our body. As Professor Stewart say, the anxiety, pre-competition, the catastrophe theory, they are related to some physiological arousal. And one of the physiological components that increase in anxiety is the cortisol, this hormone. And this hormone, if they increase, they can be dangerous for the human body and can cause a drop on performance. In the sports situation, the stress is caused, caused by the competition. So in this, in this review, uh, we can see here that the most of the athletes present an increase in cortisol salivation pre-competition. So this demonstrates the, 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 the stress, the stress generated by competition can trigger the release of this hormone that can be dangerous for their performance. So stress situations in sports is related to uh, an anticipatory response to competition. And this response can be caused by the competition level, if players play at national or international level, can be caused by game location, if they play in home and away, or even the opponent level. I will show you, you one example of, or one example of each. In, in case of the, the competition level, uh, in this study we can see from athletes to different sports, 
that when they play uh, uh, the increase in, in cortisol concentration, pre-competition compared to pre-training. On the other word, pre-competition condition, they cause an increase in cortisol concentration compared to a training condition. So competition is, is an stressor uh, situation that can increase the cortisol release. And in my PhD, I analyze this, the game location. If players from futsal, the modality of futsal, they can change the concentration of cortisol playing at home and playing away. And we find that when players are playing away, they present a higher concentration of cortisol compared to play home. So we can take this, that when players go away to play, uh, it's, more, uh, it's more stressful than when, play the, uh, when they play the, the game at home. And finally, the other stress situation is the opponent level. In other study that I helped, we analyze the player's response to cortisol and cognitive anxiety uh, from, from different uh, opponent level, like compare easy, medium, and hard level. And what we found? We found that when players play against the opponent with high level, they present higher, cortisol concentration, but also higher cognitive anxiety. So we should consider it the opponent level as a stress situation. I don't know if I, if I say it quickly, but summary, uh, I wanna uh, bring you the information that emotions and behavior can treat some hormones release. And this hormones release can impact the performance, uh, even increase the performance and even decrease. In summary, we see that the testosterone is a hormone that can be increased by motivational strategies, such as videos, but videos with some, some motivation content. And this increase by videos can improve the athlete's performance. However, when the athletes were in situation with mental fatigue, this situation can impair the release of the testosterone and this impairment can drop the athlete's performance during a game. And about the stradiol, stradiol is a ovarian hormone that they vary uh, during the menstrual cycle phase. And in phase, the, the stradiol and other ovarian hormones are high. They, they protect the atlas to the bad mood, and, but also increase uh, the athlete's motivation to train, desire to compete, and are associated with more testosterone in their, in their body. And finally, the cortisol. We know that the players can increase the cortisol concentration pre-competition, but we should consider it a more stressful situations. For instance, the game location and the opponent level. So this is my presentation and I would like to re highlight some recommendation for in, in, Max. In, in one minute, please, uh, Dr. Rana. Uh-huh. In one minute, please. Okay. Uh, my practical recommendation is um, coaches and sports psychologists find motivational strategies to increase uh, testosterone concentration, avoid mental fatigue, 
é, find strategies to minimize the negative mood when estradiol concentration are low, and finally find some strategies to reduce pre-competition stress. One of the strategy is that Dr. Andy show us the biofeedback. Thank you, thank you for having me. I hope that I, I help in this, this topic and I'm available for, for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Anna Carolina for your uh, uh, informative uh, uh, presentation. You covered and talked about the physiological responses of the hormones, uh, specifically neuroendocrine system. And you touched also the hormones versus uh, the behavior. You talked about the effect of testosterone and uh, estrogen and also cortisol on the and mental fatigue. So uh, that's just a brief uh, of what you talked about today. Thank you so much for your presentation and for your information. And uh, now we will open up for questions for all our speakers if they are still with us for about uh, 10, 15 minutes because we have to move uh, to the second session. So uh, if, if anybody have any question from the audience, please. Uh, I, I have a question, Dr. Anna Carolina, for you because I am a, a kinesiologist. So uh, now we know some, um, some athletes, they um, intake uh, testosterone. Would that be under what it called prescription or that probably out of their wishes or what they want. Okay, the, 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 the testosterone level, they have a specific level for each person. So, so each person, each athlete uh, respond to produce an amount of the testosterone. Most of athletes, uh, they use these hormones, they, uh, they, they take in an uh, other source extra body to, to put more testosterone in their body. Uh, in the beginning, this, uh, this testosterone, the increase in testosterone of body helps in, in, in performance. They grow with muscle, they grow with, uh, with power, but the body stop to produce testosterone when they receive extra body in exogen of weight. So uh, long term, they, the research say that the, um, this use can cause, can cause some damage, damage of organism. From this, the, the, they consider it the doping when you take more testosterone that you need. Okay, th thank you. We'll have a question from Dr. Mariam. Go ahead, Dr. Mariam. If you can hear me, Dr. Mariam, you can unmute yourself and uh, say your question. Dr. Ali, if you permit me, I think most of the participants 
mute because uh, to control uh, the speaker's times. So uh, I think uh, they have to uh, unmute them to let them uh, talk or like sharing their opinion with us. Okay, Dr. Sad, uh, uh, Dr. Nizar Hussain. ممكن تقفل تفك الميكروفون وتتفضل تسال سؤالك Dr. Turkey, you can hear me? Can you unmute yourself and talk? Yes, uh, I, can, uh, I only want to mention that about my presentation because uh, I have issue. So uh, I will give uh, a brief uh, summary about it uh, to uh, uh, let people understand what we are talking about. So uh, in previous research and previous research, uh, studies, People uh, collecting data from prospective uh, players and coaches and uh, how they uh, fuse or uh, believe mental toughness. However, in our uh, models, we uh, rely on theoretical approach. Uh, they call it reinforcement sensitivity theory to predict uh, about mental toughness and to examine mental toughness, which include uh, punishment and reward and three component, uh, what I have talked about it. So we have uh, suggested that those mentally toughness uh, individuals uh, who believe they are mentally tough, they should disapply less of increase of heart rate and muscle activity and movement kinematic. We have used uh, uh, ACG, AMG and uh, FICO programs to collecting data. Uh, we have done two studies uh, in this uh, research. Uh, in the first study, we collected data uh, from 70 people. Second study, we collected data. We have collected data from 100 uh, for uh, people, male and female. Uh, and we choose golf putting task uh, to control everything because we have flexibility to measure all these uh, 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 component about physiology response uh, under pressure. How we are interesting, how people perform under pressure. We manipulate the stress by telling people, if you perform well, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna uh, reward money. If you, uh, miss, uh, if you uh, uh, miss the plot or if you don't do well, you're gonna lose all your money. We uh, st manipulate the stress by telling them, uh, we, uh, we will double your money or you will lose your money. We have different uh, strategy about manipulated stress. I just want to give a screenshot or a snapshot about what we have done. We have found that uh, our, uh, mentally tough individuals, uh, they perform well. And uh, they, we found uh, uh, significant interaction between, uh, uh, when, uh, between punishment and reward and uh, uh, heart rate and... Uh, uh, movement kinematic uh, uh, component. So uh, that's a, a quick summary about what I have talked about. I hope uh, I explain it uh, very well in short time. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Turkey. Thank you. Uh, if anybody raised their hands, if anybody raised وتبدأ تتكلم. تفضلي دكتورة مريم أو السادة الدكتور نزار. دكتور علي. Good evening everyone. I am Dr. Maryam Balian, a sport biomechanist from Yarmouk University, Jordan. Thank you for your valid uh, conference and papers. Uh, Dr. Ann, I have a question. Uh, is there an acute effect of taking doping on increasing uh, injury risks? for athletes? So, uh, this uh, about the effect of hormonal doping in athletes. Is this questions about this? Yes, hormonal, yeah, the hormonal doping. Yes, uh, the, they always uh, try to update the quantity of each hormone that is allowed or not allowed. 
uh, about the effects they try to they uh, continue to study because for each athlete they can demonstrate different different response about the testosterone uh, uh, doping they found in physiculturists that uh, that they show more more behavior they, they exacerbate the behavior of aggressiveness of depression and others emotional behaviors but they they still a lack because um, uh, it's, it's difficult to, to 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 see how athletes to use and to 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 monitoring their their response. They are an excellent uh, article with women that they after they was caught in doping, uh, especially the testosterone doping. Uh, they ask how the men affects. In the men effects in these women uh, was more about emotional effects. The aggressive, the uh, exacerbate aggressiveness, the male characteristic, and also the depression and anxiety. I think it's this. I hope that I answered uh, your question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anna, for your question. Uh, I'm sorry, I am directed to end this session because uh, the other session is about to begin in a few minutes. Sorry for, we could not uh, have all the questions for our uh, speaker, uh, but uh, as usual, you can find, you can email, you can try to, co uh, to uh, contact them uh, on personal setting. Uh, at the end of the session, I really appreciate uh, again and thank Dr. Stewart for his um, presentation, Dr. Andrew and uh, Dr. Turkey and Dr. Anna Carolina. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, next time we hope we can host you all here in Saudi Arabia, except Dr. Turkey because Dr. Turkey is here with us. So. Uh, so thank you so much, and we would love to see you again in another uh, international conference, either here in Saudi Arabia or overseas somewhere. Thank you so much, and thanks for our participant and uh, audience. Uh, I'm sorry for not letting uh, more questions to come out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank you very much. Another possible explanation is a long time competition causes fatigue in the central nervous system. So let's uh, look at this uh, picture. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, so when you look at this uh, picture, can you say that uh, uh, this uh, small square is uh, in your side or in uh, the opposite side of your side? Can you keep this uh, smaller uh, uh, square sustainably or stably in your side instead of uh, at the opposite side? And uh, you can find it's uh, very difficult to focus or take this uh, smaller square in your side for five minutes or 10 minutes. It's a very difficult. So we call this is a attention fluctuation. Also, uh, if we have time, we can do a ego depletion effect uh, experiment. And as you know, uh, when we have uh, a lot of uh, self-control for a long time, the self-control resources will be deleted until we exhaust it. So at the end of the day, we use a lot of uh, resources of self-control and uh, we only have uh, maybe 10% of uh, resources to have the final self-control, which can explain why Ammons have a very bad performance at the end of the competition at the last shot or last shooting at the competition.
Uh, so uh, the strength model of self-control proposed that uh, in order to achieve self-control, energy must be consumed to control the impulses, habits, and the mental sets, but the resources of self-control are limited. Once they are depleted, the ability to control their subsequent behavior decreases. So that's why, uh, or, or one of the reasons underlying Emmons' talking phenomenon, it is called ego depletion. So, Louis, uh, excuse me. Yeah, okay. Minutes. Okay. Uh, so the reasons this. and the solutions of the choking in the competition, then we, if the cause is the scope of our attention narrows, uh, if this is the reason, we can take measures to reduce pressure and attention in terms of. Uh, uh, a cognition intervention, physiology intervention, or environment intervention to cope with the high pressure. If the reason is a fatigue, uh, we certainly, we can have a prevention and a compensation method to cope with such kind of uh, 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 problems, okay. <clears throat> uh, another, attention problem is uh, interference. Uh, in the uh, World Cup of 2006, we can see the Italian defender Materis verbally insulted Zidane and Zidane showed his iron head to Materis and was set off with a red card. Italy, Italy, eventually won the World Cup with a penalty kick after one to one draw. And we also have a certain kind of a phenomenon. At the last shot, uh, the uh, uh, basketball player will have a lot of noises uh, uh, at the background. The, the fans of the opposite team will try every method to intervene or, or interfere the, the shooting player. And when we have a high anxiety, the athletes will be influenced by the stimulus uh, instead of uh, by the targets. The targets here is the basket. And so we also have some quite eye evidence to show that uh, uh, the quite eye that represents a top-down goal directed system is the indicator of attention control. The longer the duration period of a quiet eye, the better the ability of attention control. So metro analysis also found that uh, there was a big difference in quiet eye durations between experts and novices, and a moderate difference in quiet eye durations between heat and non-heat conditions. So we can say that quiet eye is an indicator of our attention control and is closely linked to the performance level and the athletic performance. Uh, this is our, one of our experiments. You can see that uh, in the high pressure condition, uh, the uh, gazing period of the target moving process is uh, 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 prevented by the pressure and in the non-pressure uh, condition, uh, such kind of uh, attention focus will be better than in the pressure condition. Last minute. Uh, also, one minute, okay. Yeah. Also, uh, by seven weeks of a quiet eye training helps to improve football players' uh, visual attention control and the penalty kicks shooting rate. So this is also show that uh, the, the training of uh, attention fo attentional focus is uh, helpful for the athletic performance. Okay. So I will go to the last uh, picture or last uh, slides. Uh, maybe by conclusion, we can say that uh, attention is a cross road for our emotions and our cognition or our thoughts. 
Um, by better attention, we can go to the positive emotions and uh, positive thoughts. And by the bad attention, we may go to the negative emotions and the negative thoughts. So that's why attentional focus is so important for the athletic performance. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Louise. Uh, thank you for uh, amazing uh, presentation. Uh, I, I learned a lot of things from this uh, speaking. Uh, Dr. Louise, he talked about attention and optimal attention a lot. Of, and uh, he, uh, he mentioned how can we improve this attention uh, under pressure. Uh, now we will move to the second uh, speaker. We will move to the, the questions will be in the, in the end of this session. Uh, okay. Now we will move to uh, the second, the next uh, speaker. His name Frank, Prof. Frank. He is professor of uh, graduate uh, attention of sport, uh, coaching, science, uh, Chinese Culture University. He's completed his doctor, uh, doctoral uh, degree in 1998 at uh, uh, the University of uh, North uh, Carolina at uh, uh, Greenboro. Uh, he was uh, the president of the uh, CA, uh, Society for Sport Exercise Psychology uh, of Taiwan. Uh, Dr. Uh, Frank, uh, he will, uh, uh, he will uh, present uh, about his presentation. Um, as we mentioned before, we have to uh, uh, respect the rules of this uh, conference. At the time, so important for people uh, who uh, organized this uh, conference. So we have 15 minutes uh, for each speaker. Uh, please uh, follow the direction and uh, the, the mic for you and good luck. Uh, you can... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can, uh, you are immune. Uh, mute, doctors. Yeah, immune. Frank Lu, please. Yes, uh, I will, I will ask for... Okay, okay. so Dom, can you, can you hear me? Yes, the good, mic good, good. The time is uh, okay, six... Uh, now... Yes. Okay, yeah, now I... Okay, uh, so can you see my uh, PPT slide? Yes, yes. Yes, yeah. Okay. Oh, good, yeah, good, 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 good. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, this is my topic. What is uh, uh, athletic mental energy? How it influences uh, actual behavior and performance? My name is Frank uh, from Chinese Culture University, Taiwan. Taiwan is a, a small island located in southeast side of China. And it's between uh, uh, Korea, Japan, and the Philippines. I'll show you some pictures of Taiwan. It's a colorful country. Unfortunately, uh, there is a global pandemic, so you cannot come here. If someday you can come to Taiwan, you will see this uh, is a lovely country. Okay, now to my topic about uh, athletic mental energy. That's my research the two years ago. The reason why I study uh, mental energy is because energy is very important for daily life. We have all kinds of uh, uh, energy like a solar energy, uh, like uh, electricity, all kinds of energy. But what is mental energy? Mental energy allow us to uh, maintain long hours of working with long attention on a given task. That's because we have a, a mental energy, so we can produce lots of uh, uh, intelligent works and science, a new medicine and everything. And, and the, uh, uh, the contents or, or the, the factors of uh, mental energy has never been uh, well defined. 
by the North American branch of International Life Science Institute. They propose, if we are talking about mental energy, there should be contents of five elements, like motivation, cognition, quality of life, mood, and sleep. And they uh, also have many kinds of measurement of mental energy, uh, like, uh, like a mental energy scale, three item mental energy scale, and, and even pumps, even pumps. In sports psychology, there are some pioneer researchers like uh, Robert Reinderfo, Richard Hume, and Jim Rohr. They are all talking about uh, mental energy and the importance of energy. And also in some uh, uh, sports psychology li literature, uh, Research mention about mental energy, but they never they know mental energy is very important, but they they never uh, define mental energy and develop uh, mental energy scales. So uh, two years ago, I started to do my athletic mental energy uh, research in. 2018, I, uh, I, I developed a, a mental energy scale. And I also do six studies to validate my, my mental energy. We have six authors uh, to work together to produce the, this uh, mental energy scales. So we use six studies from uh, qualitative, quantitative, uh, factor analysis and to the uh, measurement invariance and, and we, we test the predictive validity. In our work, we define uh, as lack of mental energy as an as perceived existing state of energy, which is characterized by uh, its intensity in motivation, confidence, concentration, and mood. In the final stage, that's the, our major, I select mental energy scale. They have six factors. Three factors are emotion, like uh, tiredness, uh, calm, and vigor. And three factors belong to cognition, like a confidence, motivation, and concentration. So, this is the six factors of selective mental energy scales. Uh, it's uh, uh, 18 items. So each factor with three items. So it's very easy for researchers or practitioners to use uh, selective mental energy. So we, in it, it, during our six studies, we use lots of uh, uh, participants and come to, uh, uh, to involve in these studies. And, and this is a sample of the aspect of mental energy. 18 items. So it's very easy to, to uh, measure and access mental energy. Also, it's very easy to interpret uh, because it has uh, uh, 18 items. And it's a uh, 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 it's a uh, six scales, so highest score is uh, one hundred and eight score, and the lowest score is eighteen score. So from the the total score of the uh, MS, uh, we can uh, uh, understand an athlete is there in high mental energy or low mental energy, and it's a uh, very useful tool for aspective mental energy because we use it to predict uh, athletic performance, mental state, or counseling uh, with athletes or research tool. Now I uh, would like to introduce some of my past work uh, with uh, aspect mental energy and how it uh, influences uh, aspect uh, athletes' behavior. This is published uh, last year 
it, the title is Seeking uh, Positive Strengths in Buffering as Life Stress Burnout Relationship. And we test the moderating law of extracted mental energy. So uh, that's our purpose so, is to examine moderating effect of extracted mental energy on a stress burnout relationship. Uh, this is our result. Uh, the, 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 from uh, um, bivariate correlation, you can see, um, you can see a uh, um, uh, burnout is negatively correlated with uh, uh, mental energy. And also from here, from, from our uh, hierarchical uh, regression, we found that uh, all, all uh, uh, six factors of mental energy, moderate stress and burnout relationship. I will show you the, the figure. So you, from here, from here, you can see, you can see high mental energy, maintain, maintain, maintain unchanged, unchanged with, with the burnout score. But, but, but here we, we see when, when after they have a, they have a high stress and low mental energy, they open out score is high here. So, so from actually six factors of uh, mental energy all have a moderating effect. What I show you here is just a total score of sports specific risk, uh, a stressor. Higher here, but look here, the high mental energy athlete, they remain unchanged. But for low mental energy uh, athlete, when stress is higher, the open out score is higher. And, and we, we use another studies, uh, we, we use different uh, 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 samples with uh, soccer players. The, the results were very similar, but but in study two, we found either sports specific stressors or general life stressors have the same moderating effect. So, so the, congru the conclusion here is mental energy has a power to moderate as life stress and burn our relationship. And the second part I would like to introduce you is, is the influence of aesthetic mental energy and performance. We use uh, that, that this, this, the result come from uh, uh, our 2018 studies. Uh, in 2018, we have uh, in, 78 Malaysian Chinese martial art uh, students. And they uh, measure their uh, athletic mental energy uh, one day before the championship. Then after completion of the championship, we collect their uh, uh, competition records or medals. And here is, here is the uh, 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 prediction of, of medal and non-medal. Uh, so from here you can see uh, five five uh, athletic, athletic mental energy factors, including confidence, motivation, tiredness, and compose. They predict mental and non-mental. So as you can see here, confidence two times a unit to predict mental and. Uh, Motivation, tiredness, compost, and total aesthetic mental energy. Here's only we only uh, 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 vigor and 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 the other the the the, the factor is not so significant. So the second study is uh, we use a physical disabled. Tennis player to to 
to examine whether mental energy can predict their performance. In our study, we used uh, 77 physically uh, disabled tennis players, and we measured their uh, athletic mental energy one day still, one day before, uh, before a domestic tournament. Then we collect their subject rating of performance. And, and from a uh, bivariate correlation of a study, you can see uh, all six factors positively correlate with performance. And out of six factors of uh, uh, athletic mental energy, confidence was uh, selected as the, the only one to predict predict performance. So oh, my conclusion about aspective energy is, is, is a good tool to predict either performance or uh, uh, to understand it influence on, on acid behavior and mental states. But I still have some question about uh, aspective mental energy. Is there an optimal state of athletic mental energy? The second is the higher of athletic mental energy means higher performance. Because so far, we just have few studies. We need more study to examine whether athletic mental energy predict performance. And the other question is what about the low athletic mental energy? From our previous uh, study, we can see low mental energy when they have a uh, high stress, they have high burnout. But we still have to keep uh, study about how low mental energy influence athletes' behavior or mental state. And last one is the, what I would like to do in the future is can we regulate athletes' mental energy Something like uh, uh, psychological skill training, mindfulness training, meditation training. Can this kind of psychological skill regulate aspect mental energy? That's my future research direction. In, in addition, there are some uh, potential direction for. Uh, 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 doing the uh, 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 aspect of energy, like, like cultural validation and intervention and, and coaching leadership and uh, aspect of mental energy and, and to examine training loading and overtraining and, and its relationship with aspect of mental energy. So that's my presentation today. And I, 14 minutes. Thank you so no. much. Yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh respect the time. It was a unique uh, presentation, unique uh, subject. Uh, uh, from my perspective, I think uh, uh, mental uh, energy is close to mental toughness because you do interaction between them and I think uh, two different conceptualization between them. But I think uh, we have, we, we walk in the same direction. I hope we, we reach this <laughs> have reached in the, um, soon. <laughs> thank you very much. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. We will take the question in the end of this session for everyone, Dr. Okay, thank okay. you very much. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Shukran jazeelan lakum. Al-an nantakil ila al-ustad al-doktor Ugla al-Huri. أستاذ دكتور عقلة الحوري أستاذنا الفاضل وتعلمنا منه الكثير من البروفات البروفيسور المعروف وله نشاطات ومشاركات عديدة في المؤتمرات ألف العديد من الكتب أشرف على العديد من طلبة الدكتوراه والماجستير أشرف على أربعين عمل متنوع حاصل على لقب أستاذ عام 2010 الاختصاص الدقيق علم النفس الرياضي إعداد برامج الإرشاد النفسي وبناء 
المقاييس النفسية المايك لدكتورنا وأستاذنا الدكتور عبلة تفضل المايك لك دكتور عقلة هل تسمعني؟ آه ما نسمعك دكتور عقلة لو تشيك المايك لو تكرمت تفضل دكتور الله السلام عليكم عليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته تفضل الله نسمعك شكرا استاذ تركي على هذا التقديم بارك الله فيك اشكرك جزيل الشكر بكل ممنونيه انتقل الان الى فقرات المحاضره تفضل و... واضح العرض عندك صعب ولا لا أم... الان الى الان لم يحصل مشاركه دكتور طيب يوجد ايقونه في نهايه الصفحه باللون الاخضر شير سكرين انا ادوس عليها نعم ياخذ كل عده صفحات تختار الصفحه الموجود فيها الفايل ما ماذا تفتح هي السير انا عن شير سكرين طيب خلينا اضغط عليها ماذا ينطيني ماذا ينطيني سير سكرين طيب نتاكد من الهوست لا انطيني اياه ما منطيني اياه هنا الان يعطونك اياه لا بدري لا تعالى شوف دكتور الان بعد ما جان بعد ما جاء تمام طيب تفضل دكتور المعذر على ال... نعم المعذر الان واضح اي نعم اي نعم واضح دكتور تفضل المايك لك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محاضرتي لهذا اليوم بعنوان القيم الرياضية وفكرة ترسيخ التفكير الإيجابي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نرفع درجات من نشاء وفوق كل ذي علم عليم صدق الله العظيم مفهوم القيم موضوع القيم الحقيقة قديم قدم البشرية والقيم هي ضابط ومنظم للحياة في كل المجتمعات ولاقى هذا الموضوع دراسة واهتمام من الكثير من الفلاسفة والباحثين عبر حقب زمنية طويلة كان الموضوع في البداية هو فلسفيا ثم تأمليا لأنه كانوا يرون بأن العمل العقلي والفكري مجرد ولكن أصبح اتجاها علميا تطبيقيا في القرن التاسع عشر على يد اثنين من علماء نفس هما ريستون وسبرانجار استمر طبعا الاهتمام بدراسة القيم لتصبح جزء من دراسات علم النفس لاحقا لا سيما علم النفس الاجتماعي بسبب العلاقة الوثيقة بين القيم وثقافة المجتمع حيث إنها تمثل توجهات الأفراد وأحكامهم واتجاهاتهم في رفض وقبول للأشكال المختلفة المختلف عليها في السلوك الممارس والقيم من الوسائل المهمة التي تميز بين أنماط حياة الأفراد والجماعات وخلاصة القول بأن القيم تتغلغل في حياة الناس أفرادا وجماعات ويعد مفهوم القيم من المفاهيم التي حظيت باهتمام الباحثين 
ذوي التخصصات المختلفة وقد نتج عن ذلك نوعا من الخلط والتباين في استخدام هذا المفهوم من تخصص إلى آخر بل وأستخدم بمفاهيم عديدة داخل التخصص الواحد القيم في المجال الرياضي تعد أحد أهم محددات الثقافة حيث تتساوى في الأهمية مع محددات مثل النظام الاجتماعي النسق الاجتماعي وغيرها وعلى الرغم من تعدد العلماء الذين كتبوا والباحثين والفلاسفة هذا الموضوع إلا أنهم يتفقون ولا سيما علماء الاجتماع الرياضي والأنثروبولوجيا على أن القيم تعبر عن أهداف نهائية للتفاعل الاجتماعي وما ينبغي أن يكون فالقيم الاجتماعية ما هي إلا اختزال لثقافة المجتمع ودوافعه الأخلاقية لذلك فهو يشعر نحوها بارتباط انفعالي قوي لأنها معبرة عن رؤية وحكمة على الأفعال والأهداف ومعبرة عن رؤيته لما هو مقبول أو غير مقبول لما هو حسن أو سيء لما هو خير أو شر وهكذا فقيم مثل الصدق الشرف الأمانة العمل الجاد وحتى نصل إلى اللياقة البدنية وغيرها توجد في كل المجتمعات وفي كافة الأزمنة والعصور مهما اختلفت ثقافة المجتمع على هذا الأساس تعرف القيم بأنها عبارة عن المعتقدات التي يحملها الفرد نحو الأشياء والمعاني وأوجه النشاط المختلفة والتي تعمل على توجيه رغباته واتجاهاته نحوها وتحدد له السلوك المقبول أو المرفوض والصواب أو الخطأ وتتصف عادة القيم بالثبات النسبي والقيم في المجال الرياضي هي نواتج مهمة لثقافة المجتمع الرياضي ولأنها تعد جزء مهم من الموروث الديني والتربوي والاجتماعي لثقافة البلد الذي نتواجد فيه أو تتواجد فيه فإن هذا الموضوع يعد من الدراسات الحديثة في مجال التربية الرياضية إذ اقتصرت الدراسات السابقة على قياس القيم في مجال علم النفس العام سمات المشتركة للقيم هناك سمات مشتركة لمفهوم القيم بين مختلف وجهات النظر وهذه السمات طبعا مختلف وجهات النظر ومختلف الدول مختلف المجتمعات والديانات أيضا منها القيم الإنسانية الكل يهتم باللذة الألم الأفكار كل كل البشر يرتبطون بهذه القيم القيم ذاتية بمعنى أحب أكره أقبل أحجم إلى آخره القيم يمكنها أن يكتسبها الفرد يعني من الاختلاط والاندماج بالآخرين مثلا لاعب محلي يحترف في أندية عريقة هكذا تكتسب القيم القيم نسبية بمعنى أنها تختلف من شخص إلى آخر ضمن المجتمع الواحد وحتى ضمن الأسرة الواحدة ولهذا تتغير القيم بين فرد وآخر قالوا في القيم يصبح الإنسان عظيما بالقدر الذي يعمل من أجل الآخرين إذا خانتك قيم المبادئ فتذكر قيم الرجولة الإنسان بلا قيم كساعة بلا عقارب القيم ليست شعارات تحتضنها ثنايا الكتب إنما هي سمات تحرك السلوك القيم ليست ذات قيمة بلا أشخاص يؤمنون بها ويطبقونها ويحمونها من التلاشي لماذا ندرس القيم؟ الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم يؤكد على هذا الجانب في حديث شريف يقول إنما بعثت لأتمم مكارم الأخلاق في هذه العبارة الخالدة نؤكد على أن القيم ومكارم الأخلاق العربية تمثلت في أعراب في أعراف العرب قديما وفي شعرهم وأمثالهم وقصصهم الخالدة ولهذا سنركز على القيم الإيجابية ذات البعد الأخلاق العرب قديما حددوا 21 و 51 قيمة اجتماعية يتميزون بها عن باقي الأمم هذا لا يعني أن الأمم الأخرى ليست لديها قيمة ربما قيم ربما يتقدمون علينا في قيم أخرى ولكن هذه دراسات مستفيضة جريت في أو جريت في هذا المجال من هذه القيم الآداب إجابة الدعوة اجتناب الظن الإحسان الأسرة إصلاح ذات البين وتنتهي بالعدل العفة الغيرة الفصاحة الفطرة الكرم المروءة مرورا بالتواضع وحب الخير للناس الحريه حسن المعامله الى اخره لقد تناول القيم القران الكريم 
في أكثر من 1348 آية وفي الأحاديث الشريفة هناك أكثر من 1232 حديث شريف يؤكد على القيم وزاد عدد مصادر القيم مصادرها عن 3175 مصدرا يتحدث عن القيم أهمية القيم وأساليب تكوينها الأسلوب الأول لتكوين قيم جديدة في المجتمعات والإقناع يجب أن تكون هناك وسيلة لإقناع الآخر حتى من خلال البراهين والأدلة حتى نكون قيم جديدة أيضا اتخاذ القدوة الصالحة يجب أن يكون هناك قدوة لكي يكون باعث للقناعة بالقيم التي نراها جديدة القوانين القوانين والتشريعات وخاصة قوانين الدولة تفرض علينا قيم جديدة يعني الالتزام بالقوانين هو بحد ذاته يعدل من سلوكيات الأفراد وبالتالي يسن يوجد قيم جديدة الإعلام حشد الإعلام نحو القيم أيضا والدعوة إلى تطبيق القيم من ضمنها الآن جائحة كورونا يعني قيم التجنب الاختلاط قيم عدم نقل العدوى الابتعاد عن الآخر لبس الكمامة لبس الكفوف كلها قيم جديدة قيم صحية لتجنب انتشار العدوى بين ال... وهذا الإعلام يلعب دور كلش كبير في هذا الجانب الدين أيضا دكتور الدين أوكلا خمس دقائق نعم الجانب الثقافي من جوانب القيم الجانب الاجتماعي الجانب النفسي القيم في المجال الرياضي اللياقه البدنيه التربيه الحركيه الدفاع عن النفس الصحه العامه الترويح عن النفس اللعب النظيف المنافسه الشريفه من اجل الفوز كلها قيم رياضيه سلم القيم طبعا يختلف من مجتمع الى اخر في الولايات المتحده الامريكيه انشطه الفراغ تعتبر قمه السلم القيمي بالنسبه للتربيه البدنيه بينما في الصين اللياقه البدنيه تعتبر قمه القيم بالنسبه الرياضيه وهكذا العرب كانوا قديما السباحه والرمايه والفروسيه قمه السلم السلم القيمي للرياضه العربيه وهكذا في كل مجتمع هناك سلم للقيم الرياضيه متدرج القيم في المجال الرياضي قيم معرفيه سياسيه جماليه اقتصاديه طبعا الخوض في تفاصيلها طويل ولكن المحاضره بما انه قصيره راح امر عليها مرور الكرام ننتقل الى المتغير الثاني في المحاضره وهو التفكير الايجابي والكل يعرف المقوله انه الشخص الايجابي ينظر الى النص المملوء من الكاس والعكس ينظر الى النص الفارغ من الكاس ولكي يكون الرياضي ايجابيا يجب ان يثق في قدرات المواجهه على التحدي والتنافس وان ثقته بنفسه عاليه. يعتبر التفكير الايجابي احد اهم المهارات التي يحتاجها الرياضي وبشكل خاص خلال للتغلب على العوائق التي تواجهه في حياته اليوميه. التفكير الايجابي يجعلك ترى العالم مملوء بالسعاده وتلاحظ كل من حولك انه جميل ويجعل الشخص يتامل نفسه فيرى الكثير من المواهب التي اعطاها اياه الله. تعريف التفكير الايجابي هو الاداه الاكثر فاعليه في التعامل مع مشكلات الحياه اما اهميته فله يتيح الاختيار الناجح للاهداف ان العقل يمتلك فكره واحده الحياه الرياضيه مليئه بالسعاده نصنع بحياتنا الإيجابية تفاؤل الطاقة القدرة على الدفاع عن النفس إلى آخره. هاي سمات الرياضي الذي يفكر إيجابيا تفاؤل الحماس الإيمان التكامل الشجاعة الثقة العوامل المؤثرة في التفكير الإيجابي التنشئة الاجتماعية المناخ الأسري الحروب المدرسة وسائل الإعلام المختلفة الطرق التي يمكن أن يكون الرياضي بها يفكر إيجابيا رفع الأفكار السلبية قراءة قصص النجاح تحديد الأحلام ممارسة التأمل طرد الأفكار المحبطة وتفاؤل تحديد الأهداف الابتعاد عن المبالغة الآن عملية الربط ما بين القيم والتفكير الإيجابي على المدربين إعادة النظر في دورهم التربوي والتركيز على تعليم الرياضيين أنماط جديدة من التفكير يجب على المدرب إتاحة الفرصة أمام للشعور بمتعة الإنجاز واستخدام لغة علمية بسيطة تعليم اللاعبين الجرأة في التعبير عن وجهات نظرهم والرغبة والحماس في مواجهة المشكلات التعامل مع الأوليات المهمة في حياة اللاعبين تعليم اللاعبين على اعتماد التفكير الراقي الإيجابي الحر والمنظم والمنهجي استخدام المدرب أساليب وطرق وبرامج مثيرة للفضول لفضول اللاعبين تعليم اللاعبين على التفاؤل مساعدة المدربين للاعبين على استخدام استراتيجيات بديلة إيجابية 
وبلور الطرق واساليب تفكير مفتوحه جديده على اللاعب دراسه منهج الفكر الانساني واساليبه وتطبيقاته وتوفير المناخ الرياضي التدعيمي الذي يشعر اللاعب بان له دورا مهما يؤديه ويقدره الجميع داخل الملعب. فوائد القيم في ترسيخ فكره التفكير الايجابي الرياضي. تساهم القيم في ترسيخ فكره التفكير الايجابي بشكل كبير واحداث تغيرات جذريه وايجابيه في شعور الرياضي تجاه حالته التدريبيه والمحيط اذا تتغير نظره الرياضي عن ذاته والى لعبته والى مدربه وكل العاملين المساعدين له والى المجتمع من حوله وحتى المنافسين له ومن ثم تنعكس على مستوى ادائه وصحته بشكل افضل فهي تساهم في متابعه الجوانب المعرفيه والفنيه التي تعزز الحاله التدريبيه للاعب تحقيق مستويات مرتفعه من السعاده والطموح تقدير الذات الايجابي والعمل على تعزيزه سلامه الجسم من الامراض والحرص والالتزام بتوجيهات المعالج والطبيب الرياضي القضاء على كافه المشاعر السلبيه والاعداد النفسي الايجابي الالتزام بتوجيهات المدرب ومساعديه سواء كانت فنيه اداريه اجتماعيه صحيه التخلص من العادات الضاره ومنها التدخين وشرب الكحول والسهر وتحقيق مستويات عاليه من النجاح في التدريب وفي المنافسه الى هنا اكتفي بهذا القدر لضيق الوقت مع خالص التقدير للاستاذ الدكتور تركي على اتاحه هذه الفرصه لاقاء هذه المحاضره شكرا لحسن الاستماع واتمنى ان اتلقى الاسئله في هذا المجال اشكرك جزيلا شكرا للدكتور عقله الحوري استاذنا ومن الاساتذه الذي قدم الكثير في في هذا المجال من من نشر في البحوث واشراف على طلبه الدكتوراه والماجستير وتعليف الكتب فهو دكتور معروف في مجال التخصص فشكرا لك على هذه المحاضره القيمه المتعلقه بالقيم ودورها وعلاقتها بالتفكير الايجابي وكيف تؤثر على الاداء في المنافسات الرياضيه شكرا جزيلا لك والان ننتقل الى الاستاذه استاذه الدكتوره ناهده الدليمي دكتوراه في علوم الحركه والاستاذه ناهده من الاساتذه اللي قدموا الكثير في مجال التربيه الرياضيه وفي التخصص في علوم الحركه لها مؤلفات كثيره ومن لها مؤلفات في التربيه الحركيه لها مؤلفات في علم النفس الرياضي لها مؤلفات في فيزيكال اديوكيشن نشرت العديد من الابحاث اكثر ما يقارب من 102 بحث عدد الكتب المؤلفه 16 كتاب رئيسه قسم العلوم النظريه في جامعه بابل الان الدكتوره راح تعرض بحثها باذن الله تعالى وراح تتكلم عن التحفيز ودوره في تعليم المهارات الحركيه الدكتورة ناهدة موجودة المايك لك دكتورة ناهدة تستطيعين أنك تشاركين بحثك إذا بالإمكان طيب الدكتورة ناهدة ألو السلام عليكم عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته حياك الله دكتورة ناهدة كيف حالك الله يسلمك الله يخليك حياك الله يا دكتوره تفضلي دكتور الله يسلمك دكتور بس الشيرنج من من حضرتك المحاضره من عيوني الله يخليك تمرين امر يا دكتوره تمرين امر باذن الله تعالى بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاه والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين أه السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته أه طبعا بدايه لا بد لي من الشكر والتقدير إلى الأساتذة الأفاضل القائمين على هذا المؤتمر العلمي الكبير واللي يختص في مجال علم النفس التطبيقي وخاصة الأستاذ الدكتور أحمد الحرامنا رئيس المؤتمر والدكتور غانم والدكتور تركي والدكتور رحاب وكل الأخوة المشاركين في هذا المؤتمر أتمنى الموفقية للجميع طبعا محاضرتي اليوم او مشاركتي في هذا المؤتمر هي بعنوان التحفيز ودوره في تعلم المهارات الحركيه 
ما شاء الله الأخ... الأساتذة الأفاضل يعني من كل البلدان الأجنبية والعربية خاضوا في مجال علم النفس التطبيقي وكانوا يعني الأكثرية كانوا في خاضوا في موضوعات أو يعني المستويات العليا أنا موضوعي رح يختصر أو يختص في مجال تعلم المهارات الحركية الكل يعرف أنه يعني عملية التعلم اللي هي تغيير وتعديل في السلوك الحركي ينتج عن خبرة وممارسة معينة يقوم بها المتعلم يحتاج إلى الكثير من الجوانب البدنية والحركية والعقلية وكذلك يعني الجانب المهم اللي يجب أن يعني يكون عد موجود لدى يعني القائم بالعملية التعليمية هو الجانب النفسي فالكثير يعني من خلال يعني عملي كأستاذة جامعية في كلية التربية البدنية وعلوم رياضة جامعة بابل وتخصص مادة الكرة الطائرة فالموضوع جانب علم النفس مهم جدا وخاصة التطبيقي منهم فالتح... ومن المتغيرات أو الجوانب المهمة اللي هي لابد أن تتوفر عند تعلم المهارات الحركية اللي هو التحفيز اللي يعد من أهم المتكزات التي يمكن من خلالها تحقيق أهداف عملية التعلم أو عملية التدريب سواء كانت هذه الأهداف عامة أو مرحلية أم أهداف خاصة وهذا يعني وهذا كله يدور في محور معين وهو المحور الأساسي عملية التعلم هو المتعلم لأن التحفيز يعني هو عملية دقيقة وحساسة يعني مو أي أحد الكثير من المدربين والكثير من يعني المدرسين أو القائمين على عملية التعلم المهارات الحركية قد لا يجد يعني يعني ليس لديهم التمكن أو الإجادة في إعطاء التحفيز يعني وجعل المتعلم أن تكون لديه الرغبة والدافعية في تحقيق الهدف المطلوب من عنده طبعا ولدت الكثير من التعريفات يعني حتى أختصر الوقت كثير من التعريفات التحفيز أكثر يعني تعريف هو يتلائم مع عملية تعلم المهارات الحركية هو عملية إدارية للتأثير في التعلم بهدف تحقيق أفضل أداء ممكن يعني التحفيز هو عملية خارجية يقوم بها سواء كان المدرس أم المدرب وتكون عملية إدارية كيف يعني يعطي التحفيز حتى يؤثر في التعلم أو اللاعب بهدف تحقيق أفضل أداء ممكن من قبل اللاعب طبعا أنواع التحفيز أو العفو الحوافز أيضا كثيرة من يعني التعريفات اللي وردت في تعريفات الحوافز أذكر منعتها هي مجموعة من الوسائل المادية أو المعنوية التي تتاح من أجل إشباع رغبات حاجات المتعلم وهي طبعا مثابة التعويض أو الجزاء يعني أكافئ المتعلم عن الأداء المتميز اللي قام به ولهذا يعد التحفيز هو الأساس لنجاح أي أداء لدى المتعلم أو لا أو اللاعب مهما كان طبعا مهما كان إنجازه أو أداء للتحفيز أهمية كبيرة في تعلم المهارات الحركية من أهميته إنه تكون المشاركة فعالة بين المدرب والمتعلم أو المدرس والمتعلم يكون هنالك تفاعل بينهما. طبعا من اهميته أن يحقق الحاجات النفسيه للمتعلم كثير من الحاجات النفسيه التفوق يعني الجراه الكثير الكثير الوصول الى الاداء المتميز فالتحفيز يساعد هذا المتعلم على تحقيق حاجاته النفسيه كذلك يعمل على تطوير الافكار الابداعيه او الحركات الإبداعية التي تظهر لدى المتعلم في أثناء عملية التعلم 
من من اهميه التحفيز هو انه يساعد على زياده الدافعيه اللي هي هي حاله داخليه تثير السلوك وتوجهه نحو تحقيق الهدف المطلوب تحقيقه وكذلك تساعد على زياده قابليه التعلم التحفيز يعمل على ايجاد نوع من الاثاره والتنافس بين المتعلمين خاصه اذا كانوا المتعلمين يعني صغار السن او في مرحله التعلم الخام كل ما كانوا سواء كان في في مرحله المرحله الاولى من التعلم او كانوا صغار السن فالتحفيز عندما يعني مثلا المدرب او المدرس من يعطي تحفيز سواء كان مادي او معنوي سوف يعني يعمل على الاثاره والتشويق مثلا يعني يقول المدرس اللي يؤدي مثلا بالكره الطائره الطيب التخصصي اللي يؤدي مثلا 20 من تمريره ناجحه مثلا اعطيه درجه يعني مثلا بالكليه اعطيه درجه على المعدل او اعطيه مثلا مكافاه ماديه بسيطه يعني هي موجوده عدل راح يعني يخلق حاله من الاثاره والتشويق والتنافس بين المتعلمين والكثير الكثير من اهميه التحفيز لان التحفيز عمليه مهمه جدا وتكون حساسه وتكون دقيقه وعلى المدرس ان يستعملها في مكانها المناسب وفي وقتها المنافس المناسب العفو التحفيز فيه انواع او اصناف هو التحفيز الداخلي والتحفيز الخارجي طبعا التحفيز الداخلي هو انه يعبر عن الدوافع الذاتيه اللي تحفز المتعلم داخليا وخاصه هذا يكمن في المستويات العليا اللي لديهم خبره خبرات سابقه ولديهم تمكن من الاداء والثبات والاليه في الاداء انه يستطيعون ان يحفزون نفسهم ذاتيا وتصبح تصبح لديهم الدافعيه لأداء الواجب المطلوب من عنده أما التحفيز الثاني هو التحفيز الخارجي وهذا يأتي من مصادر خارجية سواء كان المدرس الزميل أي أحد مشترك في العملية التعليمية نأتي الآن إلى أنواع التحفيز وهي أنواع التحفيز الاجتماعي والتحفيز الأداء والأداء و او الانجاز والتحفيز المادي والمعنوي. استاذه ناهده تبقى نعم. خمس دقائق. نعم دكتور انا راح راح يعني اتطرق الى مثلا شروط نجاح التحفيز هي البساطه والهدف الشموليه ان تكون ان يكون التحفيز شامل لكل محتوى العمليه التعليميه ان يكون مناسب يعني ان يعطى في المكان المناسب وفي الوقت المنافس. المنا... المناسب آه، انه نربط نظام التحفيز بالاداء اذا كان التحفيز الاداء متميز يكون التحفيز عالي سواء كان طبعا هو نوعا مادي او معنوي والم...